Okay, well, thank you. We have made it to session five, uh, talking about computational tools to enable genetic diagnoses. So I'll turn this over to Donna Sobrera to open us up on that topic. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, the, com the organizers for having me, giving that opening for the fifth section, but it will be an overview because literally every slide that I have here, someone already touched on it <laughs> on one of the former sessions. So let's see what is new here. But I think um, for everything that we talked, there is a computational side, and are we re really there with the computational side to do the analysis of what we have been talking here throughout the day? So I think that's what the panel will probably be discussing the most. Um, I'm just going to touch on these issues again and just bring up what computational um, challenges we still are facing probably to get where we want. Uh, this chart, is from OMIM, and you can actually find it in OMIM. Uh, they have it updated from January 2024, and it shows the number of phenotypes and genes that are added to OMIM per year. And you can see that it has been increasing always. And we, the numbers that we have here are from starting from 2010, more or less, when we started using exomes. And you can see the, the increase in the number of genes that have been associated with disease in the last 13 to 14 years. And we keep adding, or OMIM keeps adding to it, about 200 new gene phenotype associations per year. So we, we, are, we continue finding, oops. <laughs> no problem. All right, so, so again, this data is from OMIM, and here we have where we are nowadays with the number of genes and the phenotypes that we have solved, the associations between genes and phenotype. So I think uh, Adam had this number, or at least one of these numbers in one of his slides, and the number that we have in OMIM right now of phenotype, phenotype causing genes, this is not variant, this gene is 4,860. And the genes with more than one phenotype are 1,470, and phenotypes with molecular bases known, 7,508 in 20. But we still have a lot to go in terms of phenotypes. This number that is used from OMIM, and it's an underestimation, is 3,239 phenotypes that we don't know the gene that caused this phenotype. But OMIM doesn't have all the phenotypes that are out there. OMIM has some of the phenotypes. And actually, after the exomes and genomes started being used, they started only putting new phenotypes if we already know the gene that caused them. So there are many phenotypes out there that are one case or few case that we don't know the genes that are not in OMIM. So we have many more rare disease phenotypes that are not solved at this point. So we have many genes that we don't know what the phenotype is for that one gene, and we have many phenotypes that we don't have the gene for them. So we have a lot of work to do. But we also have in OMIM these other genes that have been associated with complex diseases or susceptibility or infection phenotypes. Um, we have 503 genes to 680 phenotypes in OMIM. Again, these are not all, and I tried to go to the GOS catalog to get a better idea of what is the number of genes that have been associated with complex phenotypes, but they don't really give that statistics for us in there. Actually, it would be a great thing if we had that number minded by them, but we don't have. So these are the ones that made to OMIM, and they are definitely not close to all the genes that have been associated with a phenotype that's a complex disease or infection phenotype. So here I already said that we have about two no new phenotypes that are added to OMIM, and these are gene phenotype association nowadays. But I also have here the number of non-coded disease-causing variants that we know as of now. So it varies from 406 to 737, depending on the reference that you use. But this is very few, 
right? We know that there are many more non-coding variants that are causative of disease. The problem is that we don't know how to identify them. And this is one of the, the areas where maybe computational tools and hopefully AI will be able to help us to identify what are these coding candidate variants that we can actually try to model. We just heard all about modeling here to prove that they're actually causative or not of a disease. Um, with all that that we know, we discussed that more than 50% of the cases that we sequence, we still don't have the, 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 the diagnosis. We don't know what the gene that caused that. So again, just to show that we have a lot of information, but we are far from really getting to a complete, a complete picture of what it is that the genes that are causative of disease and what the disease are um, being caused by what gene. Now, what, what are the, some of the, the things that I think when I'm analyzing the data, I think I'm missing the most. Um, a lot of the, the, the phenotypes that are associated with genes on chromosome X, I'm definitely missing a lot of these genes that are not being well investigated. I was just showing a case to Melissa. It's a patient that has clearly an excellent phenotype. I have investigated in this family for 13 years now. We have done all these tests that we talked here about today for this family, and I can't find what the gene is. And I have a, a large pedigree. I have many people sequenced. I should be able to find what it is on chromosome X. If I'm not finding this at this point, it's because I'm really not sequencing or no, all the sequencing analysis is not picking up that variant for me. So what are the computational tools that could help us to analyze better the sequencing that we do of the chromosome X, for example? Not only that, but what about the maternal and paternal imprinting? Are we analyzing well when we do our analysis based on a mode of inheritance? Are we thinking of these mode of inheritance, like goes to the epigenetic? Do we know all the genes that are like that are imprinted and are not expressed equally between the mother and the father? So we have many of the diseases that we know, and there is a catalog for these genes that are expressed differentially between the mother, the, the paternal and maternal alleles, but they don't have all the genes have not been evaluated for that. So do we need to complete this catalog and know exactly what? For all the 20,000 genes, what are the ones that are equally expressed and what are the ones that are not? To help us with a better analysis of this mode of inheritance. And then again, to the chromosome X, the chromosome Y, I think we have been doing better with mitochondrial DNA, but still we have to do, I think, more work. And again, computational tools to investigate the, the mitochondrial variants and actually classification of the mitochondrial variants is an important thing. Most of the variants that we get are VUS. We don't know what to do with them. So how can we improve the classification of mitochondrial variants? Oligogenic and um, polygenic mode of inheritance, what are the computational tools that can help us with analysis of this mode of inheritance? How can we actually identify combinations that could be causing oligogenic disease? There are some tools that are out there now. I was just investigating some of them recently but they require you to put family per family and then they do a pathway analysis trying to connect the genes that you put in there and like give you some idea of what could be a good combination for oligogenic mode of inheritance. But I can't be doing that patient per patient. And sometimes I'm actually investigating that for a disease, a cohort of 100 patients. So how can I do that? And of course, mosaicism. We, how are we analyzing genome-wide mosaicism? How can we identify novel disease variants by investigating genome-wide all the mosaic variants. So what, are, what tools can help us with that also? When Beyond the mode of inheritance, these, many of that you found also in, in Adam's slide about what, what else could be happening when we don't find the cause. So locus heterogeneity in a small sample size, unrecognized phenotypic heterogeneity, causative gene not captured or sequenced, synonymous causative variant, causative variant in regulatory region, three nucleotide repeats, indels or CNVs, chromosomal rearrangements, inversions, balanced or unbalanced translocations, gene fusions, complex chromosome rearrangement. All these things are things that we, can, we need 
get better at somehow, if it's not with the method at itself, it's with the computational tool to do the analysis of that data. So let's talk a little bit about long read, for example. We talked about all the things that long read can get to us. In theory, are we there with the computational uh, like tools that we need to do this analysis, to do the alignment, to do the variant calling, to actually identify these variants, and not only that, to differentiate what is noise from what's truth positive, to actually show what is unique and it's not in the controls. How do we define that a variant that is in my patient is not the same that I find in the control when the overlap is not 100%? The overlap 80%, is it the same? Is it different? How can I differentiate that? Should I go by the gene? Should I say like, is it this, it's the same if all the same genes are involved? And if a gene has one exon that's involved and not the others. So how do we decide these things? How do, we, this is very important when we are trying to do the analysis and define what are the variants out of the long read that we care about. And we have talked a lot about epigenetics with the, ep, with the long read. Can we really analyze epigenetic? Well, analyze, we have a pipeline that is really well-defined as the short read, exons and genomes for this kind of analysis with long read. So I think we still have a lot to go on the computational side to understand these methods and actually take all of that out of this method. And I, I, you're the experts, and I'm sure you're going to tell us more about that and how we can get there. Um, I'm not the expert, I just use it. I use what you, <laughs> what you do. <laughs> so these are some papers that have been uh, putting together how the long read has um, been used and, and solved problems. And you can see that as of now, it's mostly related to repeat expansion and chromosomal rearrangements. These two papers are showing basically that. And it's a very important thing. Repeat expansion is a big problem. And I'm sure we are going to solve many cases when we actually can do a, a genome-wide comprehensive analysis of repeat expansion and find exactly what is new. But can we do now? Do we have the computational tools to really do that genome-wide? I don't have a hypothesis. I don't have a gene. I don't know what it is. I want to find a new thing in there that could be a repeat expansion. Can I really do that? So um, then optical genome mapping. We're talking about do we have the methods to investigate structural variants? I actually do think we have the methods. I think between long read genome sequencing and optical genome mapping and ele electric mapping, we do have what we need to identify the unbalanced, balanced, inversions, um, the, the gene fusions. What we really need is to have a, a good pipeline to identify this without so much noise and know exactly how to compare to say what's the same between my patient and the controls. And I think the optical genome mapping was very good about that. When I, I have run some cases through the optical genome mapping and the main difference between that, the results that I have with optical genome mapping and the long read is exactly the specificity of the data that they give me back on, with the computational analysis tool. So I think that was something that the optical genome mapping had that improved the analysis on my end as a user of these tools and a person who wants to do the analysis and get as few false positives as possible. Because um, that's what we want. We don't want a data that is full of false positives, right? Uh, but optical genome mapping is also helping us with mosaicism. And it, it's also getting to a very low uh, resolution. So I can actually find CNVs, indels, or structural variants that are very small, what I could not before with a SNP array, for example. So that, that's a, a, another advantage of the optical genome mapping. And then in here, oh, I, can't, I can't see very well, but it's called NABSIS, and I haven't used that. It's a new one. It's an electronic mapping, also promising to do more or less like the optical genome mapping does. So I'm just sending some samples to that platform to investigate and see what the results will be and how I'm going to get the data and how I'm going to analyze the data to see what it's going to be compared to the optical genome mapping and to the long read. But I think, again, the main thing that I'm going to be looking is 
the computational tools to do the analysis of the method. How is, what kind of data I'm going to get back? Okay. So um, in, in terms of like computational tools, I'm just going to run through things here. How is AI going to help us? And to, to me, the main thing that AI would be very helpful would be to integrate the clinical history, the biological data, the in silico predictions, and then help me to identify these novel disease genes. Right? I want to put all that together and come up with the genes that are the best candidates for my patient. There are some tools promising to do that. We are now investigating some of them in the lab. Let's see how they work. But do we have all the biological data that will allow our AI to do that? So we are just talking about that. And it was a question. I think we have to actually put this data together. I don't think AI has all the data that they need to do a, the, the great analysis that we want them to do. And when we are working with few patients, one thing that always comes up is, is statistical analysis. How can we actually get statistical analysis to help us to pick up these best candidates when we are talking about rare diseases and few patients. This is uh, uh, another paper that I was, I was working with, trying to find tools that will help me to identify non-coding variants and computational tools that will help me to prioritize non-coding variants. And you can see here that there are many listed in here. You can see the ones that I picked because I was most interested, but there are focusing on trying to integrate phenotype data and pick up non-coding. These are things that I really think we have to get better on doing and maybe AI will be able to help us. The last thing is just data sharing. You saw this graph before, you, we talked about gene matcher. The next step that we are working on is on variant matching. We have a tool that is variant matcher that is exactly allows you to go there and see if you have that variant in the database and was the phenotype of that individual. And the same way be, that we did before, we are connecting these two to all the databases, and then you can expand your search from that database to others. So it's connected to the Beacon Network, but it's now also connected to Franklin. That's a database that does the same and tells you if that variant was identified in there and how many individuals, how many heterozygous, how many homozygous. And from there, you can compare phenotypes and try to make that variant a better candidate or worse candidate. I can tell you that the main use of that, that kind of matching is to actually reclassify a variant from variant of uncertain significance to benign. You end up finding that that variant is indeed in many other individuals that have different phenotypes, that don't have overlap phenotype, and then you can rule that out of your list. With that, I'm going to let the panel go. Sorry if I went a little over. And then you guys oh, will need to like yeah. restate it if they didn't get the microphone so that people can hear. Okay. It works. Okay. Okay. Eric, you can go. Everyone, can you hear me okay? Great. So my, my name is Igor Dolchenko and I work at McBio. I'm a bioinformatician and my uh, the primary focus of my work is on uh, resolving uh, repetitive regions of the human genome and specifically I focus on, on tandem repeats. Um, of course, uh, you know, the reason why we, we care about repeats and tandem repeats specifically is that they've just been linked to, um, to a bunch of different things, including just basic gene expression changes, but also to cancer, to recently to autism spectrum disorders, also to growing list of diseases like uh, metrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington disease like fragile X and, you know, many ataxias, of course. Um, and another really important reason to care about tandem repeats, which I feel like uh, a lot of people don't uh, sometimes don't fully appreciate, is that they just contribute to a lot of variation in our genomes. And by some estimates from earlier uh, this year, actually, um, you know, they uh, tandem repeats are involved in over seventy percent of structural variants, over fifty base pairs, like in a typical you know human genome. So a huge number, right? 
Um, and so, um, you know, and, and so at the same time, there is sort of a, a lot of a significant need in creating um, computation methods for resolving these regions of the genome because in still in, in like standard computational pipelines, usually there is no, no like dedicated um, tools for um, um, in, uh, analyzing repeats, although that's starting to change. And so the basic question that we want to answer is, can we accurately call, aggregate, visualize, and interpret variation in repetitive regions of the human genome? And just to give like a concrete example, here is on the right side of this slide, here is an, um, an example of a, um, uh, a pretty tame but polymorphic region of the, of the human genome that actually, um, and, and this slide, uh, and this figure shows common alleles that, it, that occur at, at least at, um, I think, 3% fre frequency. And so you can see that there is um, a lot of variation between different alleles, not just in terms of length, but also in terms of sequence composition. And that's what we really want to capture. Uh, and now also, I guess, you know, due to our recent, not so recent discoveries, we know that it's not just that uh, changes in the length of the repeat can be pathogenic, but also changes in, uh, in, in the composition of repeats. Like, uh, I guess one example is RFC1. Uh, repeat expansion. We also know that uh, even tiny changes in repeats can be pathogenic. Like one example is uh, a single cytosine insertion in uh, the sequence of um, Mach1 VNTR, which causes a frame shift and it's pathogenic. Uh, another example is a single nucleotide substitution in uh, the sequence of uh, proximal to the HT repeat that causes uh, that hastens onset of Huntington disease. Uh, right, and and of course, like this is just um, kind of the, the you know. Um, you know, the DNA sequences. Uh, it's also very interesting to be able to resolve methylation repeats. I think very few uh, people have looked at uh, methylation of repeats across the genome. And when we do look at it now, we find a lot of really interesting patterns. Some of them are like located and in sites that are annotated as purative and cancer. So we don't really like know what this variation, why this variation is there, but it seems like it's meaningful and definitely will be worth studying. Another thing that we're looking at now is of course mosaicism. We know that mosaicism is really important um, for no, you know, non-pathogenic repeats. Repeats. And also there are some re repeats in the human genome that just seem to be very mosaic. Uh, and so it would be very interesting to resolve it more. Um, and then the final thing I just wanted to add is that one of the privileges of working for a sequencing company is that we get to collaborate with a lot of people from across the world. And I've actually asked some of them um, the questions that will be highlighted at this, at this section and, and kind of summarized in um, a pretty disorganized set of notes that are linked to the bottom of the slide. So if you're interested in maybe taking a look and also like maybe adding some comments, please, please do. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, we we'll go to Eric Garrison from the University of Tennessee. Yeah. Um, are you guys good? Is this on? Yeah. OK. Um, I'm Eric Garrison. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Uh, my group is uh, mostly focused on understanding genome variation, evolution, population scale, uh, kind of variation uh, in combination as well. And we've been working on on different kind of pangenomic methods that are they're built in a in a future which a few years ago may have looked a little bit science fiction, but in that future we just completely resolve all genomes um, as a kind of primary step in analysis. And, and Glennis and, and Tommy, to some extent, have, have touched on this. You know, we have the technology. It is not possible to do. Um, maybe mosaicism is, a, is a, an important consideration that's not kind of embedded in those systems. But if you can pay the money and you have a bit of know-how and connection community, you can actually build complete genome assemblies. So I, I, just, I just want to highlight that as something that, that's really moving. And um, there, there's a bit of a capability gap, though, because, for example, that technology is there, but but you haven't been able to apply it yet in this mm -hmm. case. So, so like we're we're really close, but we still have, have a lot of work to do. But um, actually, what's on the slide, uh, in some ways, kind of inspired by what you put, because um, it's sort of an answer to some of these things. So, if you have complete references of pan genomes in the sense that you can see many many complete human genomes, um, many genomes and any species, of course, but here they're human. You can do some really interesting things and specifically look at loci that weren't resolvable before, but using data that would be much lower quality, maybe more, more typical and available right now, which could be um, whole, whole genome shotgun sequencing or exome sequencing, potentially even, even genotyping chip uh, array data. And this, this kind of outlines this method. It's a bit of a graphical abstract. We focused on the amylase locus. Amylase is really interesting, kind of high value target to go understand. There were lots and lots of discordant GWAS results, discordant results about its evolutionary history, 
all, all kinds of things that suggested that something's going on, but nobody could find like a tagging SNP that would link with any actual variant of interest inside of it. And, and so we build this genotyping method that it builds this graph, which is an alignment of complete assemblies of the locus. And then we project um, really align short reads um, into, that, into that graph, and we can deconvolve the pair of haplotypes that they represent um, if we build the graph the right way. And in fact, the, the right way is that it collapses each allele unit of the, of the repeat into a single part of the graph. If that happens, we can do this deconvolution. Um, and, and there's this really fun result that comes out of it, which actually we're able to uh, look at the evolution of higher copy number versions of this, which are associated with better digestion of amylase um, across the last 12,000 years. So assuming maybe the onset of agriculture had some kind of kickstart to this, we see that the, the longer copy number um, ones rise highly in frequency. But this is really cool. We're using ancient DNA to do this, right? So the point, point I'm trying to say is that that's very low quality data, but having a really good reference is really, really important because it, and that's then the limiting factor and our ability to look back in the past, understand what's happening. So um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that so we can continue. Yep. Thank you. Next, Conrad Krasinski from the Broad Institute. Uh, yeah, so I guess a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has already been broached many times to, today, uh, and I'll pick on in particular. I see both Steve and Doug sitting next to each other to the um, really interesting kind of follow-ons because, you know, the ideas around uh, whether we can – create a generalizable score versus a disease-specific score and whether we have the benchmark. So we'll get to those in a second. But I guess the overarching question I have here, I'm actually going to flip it kind of back around and hope that others have ideas around this too, because the I have more of a question than a comment, rarely, uh, is which is uh, whether what should we actually be predicting? What is the thing that we want? We always talk about, you know, path, likely path as like a nice, you know, outcome for something. And but Alpha Miss Sense does this. Polyfen did this. CAD did this. You know they're getting better. I'm not saying you know there's there's still room for improvement. But these are you know they give you a single score, which is a global estimate of the deleteriousness. In practice, it's the estimate of natural selection. But same idea. Um, which you know and again and that leads to pathogenicity. But is there something that's actually more useful? In particular, thinking about whether it's a context specific or is there something that considers the phenotypic impact in the score. So maybe this is a alpha missense for congenital heart disease or, you know, uh, or, you know, something that is more more specific than a single number, which clearly we all, I think, uh, know and agree that it can't a single number can't possibly capture the breadth of effects that a variant can have. It is a good proxy. I, I enjoy my alpha missense, but it is not it is not perfect. Um, so that's, I guess, the you know, the, the questions that I want to ask here. Uh, and then to, to go back to what I, you know, started with, yeah, I guess, um, and started thinking about whether there are disease specific or context or specific tissue specific, don't really know what that means yet, but something along those lines, scores. Uh, and then, uh, you know, to, to what uh, Doug was talking about earlier, I, I will, uh, uh, you know, cheekily point out that he pointed out that there is, uh, you know, yes, we know how to benchmark these. And I don't know if that's exactly true. I, I, I agree. I know what you're saying. I, I, I think I think we're good at it. But is there are there better benchmarks that we could possibly come up with? Are there things that are a little bit more salient to the questions we want to answer, uh, you know, around around these? So, uh, I guess this is all to say that I, uh, you know, we can build these models we have as a field, um, although I will point out that the models are slowly getting away from geneticists and more towards computational, purely computational folks, for instance, alpha missense being developed solely by, you know, primarily by DeepMind and, you know, much less kind of people in this room and more people in industry. Again, no problem with that either, but it's more of just a, should we be thinking about how we prioritize these models towards what we want rather than what they think we want? Sometimes they're aligned, sometimes they're not. Just want to point that out. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, we can build, you know, we can build models that get better and better like this, but are there things that we would prefer to see out of these models, uh, which I hope we can kind of discuss, so. Thank you. And Anshul Kundaji from Stanford who's joining us remotely. Hello, <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I apologize for not being able to make it in person, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to quickly summarize um, sort of uh, 
I have a f I have a few points which are slightly more uh, future looking. Mm -hmm. um, you see the title of the slide is uh, Harmonized Knowledge Graphs of Data, Model Predictions and Literature Coupled to Interactive uh, Exploration Tools and APIs. So um, <clears throat> um, the first thing I want to start with, start off with is sort of, uh, you know, continuing to build on the theme of uh, we need better predictive models, uh, sequence models and variant effect prediction models. And I think the primary challenge is going to be uh, really long context predictive models. What that means is uh, models that actually can see and integrate information across uh, entire chromosomes or the entire genome. Uh, this is a class of models that's actually uh, critical, uh, but is actually very difficult to build uh, given the paucity of data. So current approaches are quite brute force. They just try to build big models. Uh, the big models work only when you have lots of data. We don't actually have lots of data, especially because uh, the data we have is, um, you know, is quite context specific. And so we need to build models that are specific to different kinds of functional readouts in diverse uh, uh, biological contexts, um, which as many people have discussed, uh, are largely incomplete. So we need more data sets, uh, developmental, pediatric, adult, and disease cellular contexts. Um, number two is uh, actually very important, which is uh, benchmarking. So people are building models and it's becoming increasingly difficult to find um, um, good benchmarking data sets. And people are releasing benchmarking data sets, but if you, if you dive a little deeper and figure out what's going on with those data sets, uh, and you compare uh, almost like replicate data sets analyzed with slightly different approaches uh, to create benchmarks, those benchmarks can often vary very heavily. So there's really a need for, in my mind, um, quite a bit of semi-manual curation. You know, we do this for some things like transcriptome annotations. You know, GenCode is very famous for doing a lot of uh, curation. Uh, unfortunately, that's not really caught on in many other areas of genomics uh, and molecular genomics specifically. I think that's a big mistake and we need to invest a lot more in curation. If you think about the success of these current big language models and so forth. Uh, uh, companies are spending, you know, large proportions of their finances in curating data sets. That's not just data generation, it's really data curation. There's a big difference between those two things. I don't think we put enough effort on the curation side of things. <clears throat> Number three is um, models are going to be a key commodity. Um, we have repositories for data, we have repositories for literature, we have repositories somewhat for code, Models just get thrown somewhere into some supplementary website uh, and so forth. They're going to be key commodities. And I think it's important to think about how we build genomic models uh, with open source, open weights. <clears throat> uh, Alpha Missense is not open source or open weight. And that's, uh, as Conrad mentioned, there are pros and cons to that approach. Um, number four, uh, data generation efforts typically uh, precede uh, predictive modeling. Uh, this approach, I think, has been reasonable uh, so far. But if you really want to now amplify the performance of predictor models, um, you need to also focus on observational, perturbation, and data generation efforts that are explicitly designed to improve uh, the weak points of models. And this is a sort of an inverted strategy or maybe an iterative strategy where data generation efforts uh, are informed by current generation models, including their weaknesses. <clears throat> Number five is um, we need data resources with harmonized data and metadata. The, the latter is, is really important. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, to large-scale ML is actually not just data. It's the lack of harmonized metadata. Uh, for example, even across NIH consortia, we do not have harmonized metadata. It becomes incredibly difficult to operate. That's like a no-brainer that should happen, I think, proximally, with, which will have big impact. Secondly, uh, even for data outside consortia, so like stuff that's in GeoSRA, <clears throat> I think there are ways to, again, harmonize metadata. Uh, for example, language models, uh, natural language language models can go a long way in enabling more effortless metadata specification harmonization while people are submitting data sets to Geo and SRA. Right now it's a complete mess. Uh, this is not, again, rocket science, uh, a, a focused effort could really make this a possibility going forward. Um, number six and seven are related. These are sort of next generation ideas. People are trying to build uh, really exciting genomic knowledge bases. These are entities, graphs that hook up 
uh, various biological entities and the relationships between them. Uh, these are typically populated with literature, but you can now populate them also with predictions from models and other information derived from data. And this could be done across many biological, genetic, and disease contexts. Right now, again, they're popping up in different areas separately. Unifying them will be really nice. Now, once you have these knowledge bases, how do you actually use them for exploration and discovery? Well, again, you can build next generation tools, uh, search recommendation exploration engines. For example, hooking up chatbots again, directly onto these knowledge graphs. So they don't hallucinate, they give you factual information. They can do natural language search, coupling these to genome uh, browsers and all kinds of visualization tools. So the users can engage with the data and model. It's not just a dead database with a 1980s front end. It's really an interactive experience where you communicate with a model. The model works with you to debug uh, a variant and so forth. And you can even think of building specialized apps on top of them. So that's that's what I'll stop. That's just sort of the, the vision and some ideas. Thank you, Anshul. Okay, I'll pick that up. So just as we get into questions, maybe I'll start with um, just an, with an observation that sequence data are tractable for computing um, sort of intrinsically. And so a lot of this focused on sequence data. But in the previous sessions, I did hear a lot of conversation about phenotypic data tooling. How do we do? How do we make that a first class um, item in our computation? Any thoughts on uh, where we are on those two pieces and where the balance is, where it ought to be? I would just say there are some tools that already use phenotype to try to prioritize variants, right? Um, we have phenomizer or exomizer or genomizer. There are some of the tools that actually use the phenotype to try to prioritize the variants. Um, Diane was just telling me about one of her tools that she's working on that, yeah, exactly, that you will also try to use phenotype to prioritize the, the variants and the genes in a list of genes and out of a sequencing data. I don't think that they are perfect, but they may help. I, I, don't, I don't really know how much they help. And I, I, I would say like mainly for novel disease gene discovery, I don't know if we know how much they help. Uh, I think we need to use them more, we need to to actually investigate them better to see how much they are going to use. I think they have been shown to help on the discovery of variants in non disease genes. I don't know when we are investigating novel disease genes, the ones that we don't know nothing about, and we want to know if that gene causes that one disease, how helpful it will be. So I think we have to investigate more, use more to know better how they can help. So I just to, to respond to, like, I, I'm, I'm sure is right. Like, I think spot on in answering this in the sense that we, we, we need to use linked data kind of techniques to bring to bring these phenotypic information to bear on genomic data to sequence data. Uh, the sequences have coordinates, they have ranges. Those can be projected into, into knowledge graphs and RDF. That's, that's, uh, there's standards for that. They existed for 10 years. And I think we're, we're mostly lacking um, knowledge about how to use these things and uptake of them um, that could improve interoperability. To, to bring this additional information to bear on, on the sequence data, which as you correctly note, is very tractable. Um, any other? Yeah, I just want to say one quick thing there. So I think on one hand, we, we, we say that we definitely need a lot more data and in the right context, but I think similar to what Eric just said, uh, there, the existing data that we have and the existing resources and infrastructure can definitely be used much more effectively. I mean, there are cases sitting around probably just waiting to be solved because you're not connected the dots. And it's an infrastructure project. It's very feasible. Uh, it's it's more feasible than sort of waiting for all cellular contexts to be profiled and all functional readouts to be obtained and all long read sequences to be obtained. Like I think the infrastructure projects can definitely uh, occur right away and they will build a foundation that you can keep adding to uh, as you generate more data and as the technology improves. But we have an infrastructure problem, which which we should try to solve. 
So I, I guess as an example of, of uh, where these linked data are being applied right now in, in healthcare, there's this um, this project called FIRE, um, which I, I I know just next to nothing about. I have to apologize, but I want to I want to raise it as something that's very interesting because this is a kind of a medical record harmonization technique that's based in exactly these kind of knowledge graphs that's being applied uh, by industry and by hospitals um, in, in many places. Maybe the only option that's that's uh, interoperable. And and so like the, these techniques have come of age, and it's really it's really a moment to decide to to put it all together. There's there's plenty of data there. We don't have to wait for better data to to use them. Yeah. One thing I will uh, suggest though is that there is a kind of requirement here for that data to be you know if we want to interpret sequence data, having the data that is like linked to the with the same people. So the person whose genome you did is the one you ran a you know RNA seq experiment on, or you did the EHR mining on. Uh, separate kind of data sets help. But not as much, you know, there's more power in that kind of, you know, uh, combined analysis. And, you know, this is the, largely the same principle that was led to the success of GWAS. You have both matched phenotype and genotype data and you do the analysis that way. Um, and the same will go for models as, you know, as these large language models, you know, p p taking models, uh, data types together that you can then stitch models together and say, OK, now we have, you know, we have some information from non-coding variant uh, predictions. We have some very uh, information from you know, understanding what genes do in context of cellular, in, in terms of cellular um, networks and pathways, that can kind of putting those together within the same people in order to interpret the genetic variants is, I think, really going to be a super powerful with some methods development needed along the way. I don't think we're, you know, I don't think it's out of the box right now, uh, but I think it's, you know, we can certainly at least uh, envision these methods working. So. It's, it's definitely true for language models yeah. right now. Like the, some of the things we need to get language models to bear here, like long context, for example, or multimodality, like being able to read human language or read a paper and then then go and read the DNA associated with it. Like that, that those don't exist right now and not, not in any, any realistic way. Um, it will take time to see what the best ways to build those are. That's something I'm many groups around the world, including mine are racing to try to figure out because it's, it's an obvious next step we really have all been convinced by the the power of of these um uh agentic systems that that are based just on on human experience and, and knowledge and it would be amazing to expand those into into our space to get them to touch the you know, sequencing data and phenotype data yeah as well i mean it, it's is the nih gonna you know want to fund the development of those kind of models maybe in, in part in the sense that it overlaps here but that that's like it's not ready to go in yeah. the same way that the knowledge graphs are. So there's really cool, I mean, the models that are being developed in the kind of large language model space, including these models called CLIP, which are effectively image, like image and text joint models. So effectively the under the hood, what happens is the, I think of it as cue cards. They teach the model, they show it a picture and they show it some text and say, match these up effectively. How well, how well can you match them up? And that kind of teaches the neural network to, to learn about images and, and text in a joint way. Uh, I've been kind of, my pet project has been thinking about, is there a good way to you do this kind of thing for genomics? Is there anything that's like genome on one side and phenotype on the other? Probably overly complicated, but when you get into, and the problem with that a little bit is sparsity. You need a lot of data in order, a lot of paired data. You need to know that this variant affects this phenotype in order for that to be a successful approach. That might be a little bit more tractable with molecular phenotypes as they yeah. kind of get a little bit more... Um, you know, a, a little higher throughput than mining a, 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 a in just, chart. I mean, it just to note, there actually has been a paper this year, a preprint about um, four molecular fleet phenotypes, so gene expression and implementing the synthesis of DNA hypersensitivity sites uh, based just on unlabeled data from cell lines. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they proved that they could build a model that would synthesize a particular DHS site that would be active in only a certain set of the cell lines they're working on. Um, it's actually from Luca Pinello, mm -hmm. who's at at MGH. Mm. So, but that's again just coming online, like just the very beginning. So, moving to the next question, Dan. So, I was wondering, you built a um, common fund knowledge graph, um, but also like a hybrid data methodology that just built the table. We use things like uh, BMLS and a bunch of other ontologies, and we merged a lot of data. So, what we ended up working with. Second of all, when you put in a 
grant for something like this, we hear exactly what you said. Strong model benchmarking data sets and infrastructure. The benchmarking is very important. When you put in these kinds of grants, you might get back responses that say data integration is not that valid, uh, not that innovative or important. And we don't see the importance of benchmarking well. Yeah. Um, so how do we convince people that this is a very important thing to do, this point number three? Because you can generate all these models, but if they're not benchmarked, even if, even if you don't compare them directly to some sort of benchmarking method, how can you convince people that this is a very important thing? And top and also the data integration course. Well, what would you what would you what would you suggest? Because I don't think people recognize the importance of it. Just a quick question. Anshul, could you hear any of that? Uh, I got snippets of it. <laughs> So I can I can repeat quickly. So, but basically, just how, how do we convince in in like say grant application review processes that that like it's important to do data integration and really valuable and and the benchmarking is is really important even if they don't seem innovative and and exciting. Is that is that a fair characterization? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you want me to take a stab at that or someone someone else? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I think for benchmarking, actually, uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of these uh, public challenges and so forth run, uh, and there are entire organizations dedicated to setting up benchmarks. But the focus is generally on showing that the benchmarks actually help and work. It's sort of uh, it's sort of critical view at benchmarking. Um, I think people need to. Uh, as a community, you need to publish more on <clears throat> the issues with benchmarking uh, when you use sort of, as I said, related benchmark data sets that target supposedly the same thing, but from different labs, different processing methods, different uh, experimental designs, uh, and how that impacts the results of the benchmark. Uh, so I think uh, there's plenty of work to do there. Um, those are pretty justifiable, I think, from, even from a grant perspective. Um, and once I think that is shown, um, it becomes amply clear that, you know, data integration, benchmarking become really critical. Um, I don't know if that answers answers the question. I got I got pieces of it, so I don't know if that answers the question. Anyone else in the panel? I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, essentially. Uh, how do we convince the community that these models are valid and that the, the benchmarking part and the data infrastructure uh, in the integration are valid, important things? I get you don't have to really answer that directly, but that's just a comment that. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to apply them to real case studies and show that they actually work. Right, that that would be the way to go. Um, you could do it on a small scale, specific diseases, disease uh, tissue systems, um, and show that they work, and then people would actually think that they do. Uh, as compared to currently, it's it's all um, it's all more of an exercise. It's not really trying to take the models all the way down to seeing their impact on the downstream endpoints. I I think uh, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead. Yeah. So I'll just do a real quick follow up on this. I think it'd be really amazing to convince people by letting them play with the model. And I think we we now we have kind of a critical mass of folks understand how to use these chat models. And if you provide that kind of interface on top of one of these things that is run on public infrastructure, like like Galaxy, for example, so works too. that could be a really um, rapid way for people to, to gain confidence. I think you also brought up data integration, right? Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to make a comment that, uh, like, even like language models and AI aside, I think this is something that people have a lot of trouble with. I was just like a couple of weeks ago talking to interpretation uh, scientists and asked her, like, how do you like how do you work with multiomics? Do you work with multiomics data? And if so, how? And she said, well, we do. Uh, and so, like, say if I find a variant that I think might be like affecting splicing or some kind of like it has some kind of expression defect, I just and if I have matching RNA seq data, I just load it in my GV. 
and I just look at, I just try to eyeball um, whether, like, you know, whether there might be a real defect there or not, right? And this is, um, you know, obviously, like, requires a lot of skill, very error prone, and just like a huge area for uh, improvement, you know, for like methods developers. So I feel like, you know, things like that should be somehow highlighted, um, you know, and and so maybe like if they do, it will be easier to get money to do to do that kind of work. <laughs> Carolyn. So Conrad, I mean, you were talking about the sort of model of a score, right? And we have these different ways that we do scores and implicit or maybe not, or maybe I just interpret it, you know, as the idea of like scores versus categories. And then I also think there's like how much evidence, how much confidence do we have in a particular score or a particular classification? But is there something right now that you think, I mean, what would you if you were going to design your perfect score right now, what would you use or what is missing to allow you to do that? Um, <clears throat> that's a great, great question. I'm not actually sure. I think, uh, you know, the having the ability to, uh, I guess some of it is really that benchmarking framework for having, you know, some, some way to assess that the, the score is valid. Um, but I recognize that, you know, even just by saying score or, I mean, in reality, the, uh, a lot of when we put out a score, people just ask, what's the cutoff for bad? So they don't actually, people, a lot of people don't actually want a score. They just want good, bad. They, you know, yes, no, um, which is even more, slightly even more frustrating in a way. I, I understand why I don't, I, I don't begrudge anyone of that, but it's also slightly more frustrating in a way because it, you know, it gets us away from what I was just suggesting, which is a little bit more granularity on the question. Um, and so, you know, ways to assess that and ways, you know, and in a, uh, kind of multi-modal way, although I'm not using that word in the way that we've been using it recently. But I mean, uh, by that I mean using uh, being able to assess simultaneously a score and a mode. So something like if there is a uh, you know um, a disease-specific alpha missense, are you doing your a score? Are you doing well with that score specifically for that disease? And you know, and I guess maybe there's a kind of two axes here. There's the score itself, and then the specificity towards the particular thing you're asking about. Um, and you have to uh, model those two simultaneously, which is hard statistically. Uh, so I don't actually know. Yeah. Can I make a comment. Um, so when I, I when I think about this discussion, I'm thinking, what's the goal? You just said something, Cora, that made me think even more about that. What's the goal of the score? Are we talking about creating a score that I will get that score and I that variant has a score of one. I can go to the patient and say, this is a pathogenic variant. I don't need anything else. That's it. Or are we talking about a score that is going to differentiate what is, I don't care about that, that's benign. These others I may care about. Or are we talking about a score that is going to tell us, these are the few ones that I need to do functional studies. That, these are the ones that I think can really be splicing and they deserve the extra time to do a mini gene in the lab to prove that it is a splicing variant. So I think that is a it's a it's a thing that would be good to us to know. It's like what is the goal of the score? Because we may be aiming to something that won't happen, and then we are just going to be talking about something that's never going to happen. You may think that it will happen, and I, I you're the experts. You tell me. Are we going to get a score that's going to tell us? great, this is it, go to the patient and tell them that he has the disease or she has a disease. Is that what we are aiming for? Because then it, I think it will make it easier to us to actually understand what we want to do. I guess can I follow up on that a little bit? You know, because I think when thinking about these scores, we often think about this is a change in function, but really for a lot of clinical phenotypes, knowing whether or not it's loss of function, gain of function, dominant negative, is incredibly important. And moreover, when thinking about this from a therapeutic perspective, not just knowing that this is a change in the splice site, but actually knowing what is the prediction in terms of what the new splice site's going to be, what's that new transcript's going to be in terms of now trying to think, is this going to be a patient where it's worthwhile to go after do mini gene assays, you know, do sort of some sort of assay to figure out what the full length transcript is that could then be targeted from an ASL perspective, I think is incredibly valuable. So I think that I really like your point, Conrad, thinking beyond just simple, you know, yes, no into these nuances, you know, even if it is just a predictive perspective, it does require subsequent, you know, follow up is still valuable. Well, yeah, I think you're okay. Yeah, I was going to ask it. Well, make kind of a, a comment. So I think there's two ways to think about scores and predictions, right? You have one on function, but 
ultimately, I think the goal is, is this useful in a clinical setting is kind of what we want to go to, right? So there's understanding basic biology and, and, and those sort of things, which I think is fantastic and how some of these scores work. But when you talk about including the phenotypic information, you want to know, to your point, is this the causative variant in this patient and can I report back on that? And I think the bar for that is much higher, much, much higher than, than we really speak to. And I think it has to be demonstrated in clinical settings, right? It, you ultimately have to take it to the clinic, have to do those studies. Those are expensive studies. They need to be funded. Most industry par partners don't wanna fund those studies, but I think ultimately to, to move the needle, you know, that's what we need. And I think the second thing we have to keep in mind is that the training data and the validation data has to be separate. We have a lot of kind of circular logic in some of our models. And we really need as a community to say, you know, this is the sort of data that we're using for training. If we're going to benchmark, this is the sort of data we use for validation and make sure that, that, that they're separate. But I think the bar clinically is, I think, pretty, pretty high. I think Heidi's next. So I just want to uh, bring up a couple of things on that line of discussion. One is in the next guidelines for sequence variant classification, two things, two major differences. One is it's a point scoring system. And so the in silico prediction scores will no longer be a threshold sort of thing. It'll be rebel score of X gets you this point, that point, you know, like different point values. Um, and so we will be able to actually grade these instead of just a black and white yes, no. Also in the guideline, we'll be releasing guidance for VUS t subclasses, VUS low, VUS mid, VUS high. And these will be recommended to be put on clinical reports and returned to physicians. And the benefit of that is that it'll help the clinician decide when to spend time on a variant and doing the follow-up, as you were saying, uh, because right now most VUSs become benign, except when you're talking about the VUS highs, they are equally likely to go to pathogenic or benign. So I think that we'll actually start to be able to engage the physicians in more productive use of their time in following up on these variants and actually getting more data that can inform them if we don't give them like massive volumes of VUSs, most of which will go to benign. So I, I think there's hope for a system that we can better engage on the clinical side. Um, and hopefully that'll be out before the end of the year. Okay. Here. So I thought, Heidi, you are going to mention about that dirty word probability. Um, and that's what we really work with in medicine, right, is probability, not absolutes. And that's the kind of information I think we'd find most useful is, is helping to uh, go to one side of the equation or the other. And the and when you have incomplete information, um, then there's other statistical, rather than frequentist approach, you can use Bayesian approaches because if you have some information a priori, you can use that. And a lot of times we do in medicine and even with genetics, we have a priori information. And then you can calculate conditional and, and work from there. And you can use even empiric approaches if you wish to make some just guesses ahead of time. So how much have you guys thought about moving or incorporating that kind of thing? Because physicians, to some extent, are familiar and comfortable with Bayesian because they uh, because they use it in with they're going to predict survival for cancer. They're going to these things. They they're not giving you an absolute number. They're giving you a percentage number. Much of the public may not be quite as familiar, but at least we can explain it to them. So. Is this something you guys have considered or you already incorporated on just not recognizing that that's already into your models? Uh, I mean, you know, we are, I've, I have been trying to push all of our kind of scores and everything to be much more continuous, which gives you a form of, you know, that it's not quite exactly what you're describing, but it's, you know, it has some, some element of that. Um, and I'd love to see, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I would love to see what happens with the release of these new guidelines and, uh, you know, and seeing what, what it actually means because that you know it's not a continuous but it's you know splitting bus into three different categories is a creating more of a scale right like you know yeah it's a little more than you know than than what it was before um and i'm curious to see what happens when that does go into effect because that'll kind of inform a little bit of that is like how much do, should we actually be pushing in that direction um i mean i you know the from a public health perspective probabilities are always going to be better than cutoffs right i think that is always a that, that is the case um when you're designing things like 
you know, polygenic scores or, you know, the, that kind of, you know, those more continuity does help, uh, but, um, and including in the middle of the distribution as well. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what the, the implementations may be. The issue with the middle distribution is it's biologically well understood uh, to some extent. There's hypomorphs and so forth, right, variants that create these intermediate phenotypes. And we don't describe them as much because we don't study the intermediate phenotypes. There's the sort of very mild versions of things or the ones that don't come into the clinic, but they're out there. If you study them functionally, you can see where there's subtle effects on protein function and they just are not exhibited or fully penetrant. So these VUSs may be sitting, some of them, in that sort of middle space and uh, trying to flavor them a little bit one side or the other might inform whether or not now I have to go and do more studies because we've got something that may be a biological rationale behind why it's sitting as a VUS with some, yeah, some possibility of being shaded to one side or the other. And that helps us. Okay, we got to study that more. And so it, uh, uh, anyway, so that's that's the other challenge about that middle read. It, it, it's a distribution. It's, it, it's, a, it's a Gaussian distribution. It's not. We just work on the outsides, right? And in fact, we work on one side. It's a one-sided argument right now we use. But really, the whole thing biologically is, is a distribution. And, and, and working on the middle will probably power better your approaches. So I'm, I'm going to riff a bit on this. So um, I've been thinking a bit today about the term variant. Uh, which is rip good and good riff, bad? Riff. It's good. Riff. Oh, I just said riff on it. I thought, oh, I'm going to get... Uh, no, no, I love it. Get, get some, uh, get some I love it. <laughs> education here. <laughs> no, no, exact opposite. No, it, I think it, it, it raises a really good point. The, the Bayesian aspect of, of what we're, we're doing in, in the broad sense, like has to be remembered. And uh, the, the, that's what I've been thinking about, about the term variant, because it, it, there, it implies a prior, which is the, the non-variant. What is non-variant? It means like in practical terms, it basically means a reference right now. Um, and, and that's something we are changing, right? Because we have this human pangenome project. And so, you know, when you have nomad, we have all these databases to describe like the scope of the variation. Um, perhaps there is even a benefit to thinking of things as alleles and not variants to acknowledge the fact that practically everything is variable, uh, to some, at some level. Um, but I guess that's all the thought is so just, uh, just a, a concern, a concern that, that maybe we have a, a bit of a capability educational gap about thinking about alternative genomes, alternative haplotypes. Um, this comes up in the consideration of structural variation, which you, you brought up. What does it mean when structural variants overlap? How do I know they're the same thing? The, the issue is that we're projecting everything through, uh, by, by standard, we're projecting everything through one reference, and that this leads to all kinds of technical problems about understanding. Um, maybe if we have some multimodal language model that we can show an IG, IGV screenshot and uh, a bunch of genomic sequence too, it'll be able to help say, oh yeah, th those are the same because I, in my, you know, in my model internally, I've aligned them and, and so they're the same, but that, that again, doesn't exist yet. So I just want so. to bring up that the scores are very important. I think even more on the gene discovery side, because when we're talking about a non-disease gene, we have other things that may help us to classify that variant more to the pathogenic side or to the benign side. But when we're on the discovery side, sometimes we know nothing about these genes. And like sometimes we have no biology to go after for that one gene, or sometimes the biology that is known is completely misleading to what we are investigating. And they saying like, that's not it. Like a spermatogenesis gene cannot cause microcephaly hearing loss and seizures, but it is it. So the scores play a really important role in here because I can actually say, no, look at this score for that gene and look at that score for that variant. It is a good candidate. Even I know nothing about the biology or the biology doesn't match the phenotype. So just I just want to say like that this work needs really to be improved as much as we can because for this gene discovery is even, I think, personally more important than for variant classification of non disease variants in non-disease genes. So this, I guess it, this leads, sorry, yeah. well, it, I mean, it just leads into another kind of related thing about, we, we, I mean, again, speaking of, again to uh, Anshul's slide, which is still up, but about this harmonization of data. I, I've been having research experiences lately, which I, many of you might've had, where you, you're starting to use these language models that are linked to 
to real data and so that you can you can chat with the internet in effect and get and get information back that maybe would have taken days or, or weeks of wandering around through many many google scholar searches to try to understand um, however the interfaces of this are, are very very nebulous it's just like chat with this bot and then some companies set up something on the back end you don't really know how it works and they're not being very forthcoming about it so maybe the model they're running is open weights but you can't figure out how it's being used there's, there's an opportunity there to make something that is a bit more um, in the public uh, interest that would support research. And, um, you know, the, the NIH has a long tradition of helping to curate research data, the products of research, which actually, like, give us this kind of qualitative fuzzy information that's outside of the, the scope of a score, maybe, but, but can come back and help you understand. So you can, you can take this gene and take a few concepts, put it in you know, together and find a lot of papers that that match it um, using these kind of systems. I, I just don't think that their quality and the precision is is what we need for research yet. But I, I do I do feel like that's an emerging emerging trend that could be really fascinating to to explore further. And sort of I think in a way building on that, I think uh, you know Heidi had a really good point for anyone who can remember this morning, which seems like days ago at this point about you know the the innovation versus standardization trade-off in technology. And I think some of that carries over into some of this um, computational advances that we're talking about. And I guess, Anshul, you can't see I'm looking at you, but if I'm looking this way, I'm looking at you as well. As we think about, I think we're really still in the innovation space with a lot of this, right? And we want to be pushing the innovation space. And I recognize that. But what is it that we should be making or we're doing while we're pushing the innovation space that's gonna lead to things that will be positioning us better for, for when we're ready to standardize. And what are there things we're not doing right now because we're just sort of lost in this, you know, we're just sort of from an NIH perspective, I know the rest of the world is, but an NIH perspective, we just have our deep, you know, our toe in the deep end. What should what should we be, what will allow this innovation to lead towards a, a place where we're ready to start? standardizing and moving some things through at that sort of scale. Yeah, I'll just take a quick stab at that. So <clears throat> amongst the points I mentioned, I think there are a few that are sort of, yeah, forward looking and need need just better stuff. But um, I'll just list a few, which I think we could, we could have or should have <clears throat> gotten going much earlier. Uh, number five, for example, harmonizing data resources across the NIH and then also other public data sets, and even the knowledge basis. Again, there's nothing holding us back from building those now. Uh, it's not gonna be trivial to initially build these up and sync them up. But once they're done, like as you get better models and better predictions and better data, uh, that just, you know, it's a self uh, reinforcing system, right? Again, point number seven is slightly forward looking. So maybe the chatbots won't exist today, but the knowledge graphs do people can do a lot of interesting research on building chatbots that hook into these knowledge graphs. Um, think of ways in which you can provide <clears throat> not just uh, static scores, right? we currently do, but maybe uh, ways to interact with those scores, get more information. I mean, I think a lot of the scoring metrics designed currently for clinical variants, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, not an expert on this, uh, are very focused on coding variants, uh, tend to be a lot more context independent to a large extent, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to modify those kinds of scores uh, to take into account non-coding variation or more complex effects, um, even more complex types of variants like SVs, you know, doing all kinds of things simultaneously. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for innovation on that front and some things could be done right away. Other things would build on top of it. So it's it's uh, definitely not only futuristic, future looking. We have about five more minutes in the session. Also, uh, one other quick thing was, you know, the curation of benchmark data sets and things like that. Again, those, those could be done uh, right away. I think the, some of these uh, efforts are not like, as somebody mentioned, they don't fit the traditional, you know, science funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, they're not considered, uh, you know, um, particularly glorious scientifically. A lot of them are just like, 
really hard work putting stuff together, connecting the dots. Um, explicit funding mechanisms for these kinds of efforts could be quite productive. But really focus on resource generation. I think a lot of resource generation efforts get sidetracked to doing science. Uh, I'm saying this is also science, but the more traditional science. So yeah, those things could be done right now. Just wanted to add a couple of more points and maybe really adding to what uh, Ali is what Ali has uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so of course, benchmark be benchmarking is going to be important, and uh, finding ways to ultimately validate these models uh, in independent data sets, in particular, is going to be critically important part as we think about using some of these scoring modalities in clinical setting. One of the other challenges is, you know, we're largely talking about sequence data, which um, at least theoretically, it's simple data, it's binary. When we start talking about other data sets, functional data sets, where we deal with non-binary data, um, one of the big challenges is 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 what we call in 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 kind of a you know biology space a batch effect, right? So when you think about using any one of these models and integrating them across a broader system, where you know labs are in theory going to be generating the, this data at scale. You have to accommodate for the fact that there is going to be a batch effect that's going to impact these predictive models. I'm only saying this because we, you know, have lived experience. We develop epi signatures and discovery cohorts. We validate them in a blinded setting through, you know, labs that are generating data independently. We know the batch effect is a real thing, and it does impact it very significantly. So, you know, I guess you know, going back to the previous point here, as we start developing these things, we need to think about all of the back end stuff that's going to be practical ultimately for application of these you know predictive models in real life scenarios where we're going to expect you know labs around the world ultimately to be able to generate these data and plug it in, in, in into these systems and come up with a scores that's just kind of a generic comment and i don't know what everybody else thinks about are we are we thinking about these things for more complex data sets uh Maybe just a quick comment on, um, like, on the batch effects. I think that's also underlines the need to to share raw data as much as possible because that's that's a big that, that's a big problem sometimes. Exactly, you just download a call set, or like uh, that will say, um, or um, you know, um, some other data set that was already like normalized and uh, the variants were like say cold or, or some other features, right? And then it's very difficult to integrate it with 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 say maybe your other data sets because that normalization step has already been done and you cannot undo it. So, but uh, but things are much easier when when we can still have access to the raw, raw data, which is, yeah, sometimes possible. I, I guess this batch effects kind of fall under the topic of um, data curation in general, right? Like you might, it, it's a whole, whole project to decide if certain data are within within bounds that you can still use. Um, and then the, the flip side of it is also that it, it could be that you want these kind of models to learn about the batch effects, which maybe they will, as long as the data is appropriately annotated, that they're they're seeing, or they're, they're seeing that it comes from said center. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they make they may pick it up as long as you're honest about where the where the data comes from. You know, as long as long as there's a correlate there to to learn from, then yeah. We ensure that we generate from multiple different institutions, mm -hmm. from multiple different machines, by multiple different, you know, web lab analysts as, as they generate the data. And that sometimes helps us account for the theoretical batch. Mm -hmm. The model is ad hoc. Yeah, I see. I, well, just, I'm just repeating it for Anshul, that they, they're doing many things to avoid batch effects by repeating what they're, what they're up to. Yeah, it also goes back to <clears throat> why you require rich metadata, right, for for the samples. If you don't have metadata, you can't, you can't, you can't even account for the batch effects or, or any other covariates. I mean, not just batch effects, but you have big multifactorial studies where you have disease, sex, age, all these things changing, and if you don't track them down, uh, how can you how can you account for them? Like it's a this is a very basic problem, right? It's not it doesn't require fancy machine learning. It's a data management problem. It's a way of allowing people to, so the, the burden is thrown on the data producer, right? Or the person submitting the data. And of course, you're not gonna like spend six months trying to figure out all this stuff. So we need to kind of build interfaces that make that easy, right? Uh, provide uh, approximate metadata that in, in sort of, you know, natural parlance language, which can then automatically get mapped to ontologies, blah, blah, blah. Right now it's all like a very structured approach. 
but it could be done much more efficiently. I think metadata is like a totally underappreciated aspect. If we had richer metadata for all the samples that are currently in public databases, <clears throat> machine learning models would work infinitely better than they currently do. Uh, it would be much easier to build large data sets that you can train on. Right now, it's a it's an absolute nightmare. Like you try to build them, you control every aspect, reprocess everything from scratch. Even things that large consortia generate, you have to eventually go back and reprocess because like, you know, it's, but luckily you can do some of that because some of these efforts do produce a high quality metadata. But in general, if you see what's available in public databases, it's so scanty and like you can't, the data is there, but you can't really do much with it. So on that, on that theme, we are at time. So I do just want to thank the panelists and the participants. Okay. Over to Lisa. Okay. Yes. I think that all of our personal batteries are going the way of the microphone batteries at this point, which is great because the, um, I think the shuttle is going to be outside. If you're staying at the Bethesda Marriott, you can take the shuttle back home, have dinner on your own, recharge your battery. And tomorrow we'll be back here. We're gonna recap some of the big themes that we heard today. Uh, we're gonna talk about all the things that we didn't discuss today. So think now that you know the topics that were sort of in range today, what is really important that we didn't think of? We'll talk about that tomorrow. And then also remember, your homework is to come here tomorrow with some specific sort of recommendations for us about where NHGRI should focus our efforts going forward here to really sort of move the needle. So what are the highest priority needs? What can, what is actionable kind of steps we can take now? Also, what are sort of your pie in the sky ideas? If we could do anything in the whole world with so much money that we don't have, but like, pretend that we did. Um, what would that look like? What is sort of the ideal kind of situation? And that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, I think your shuttle is picking you up at the hotel tomorrow at eight o'clock. So you get a whole additional 15 minutes. But you went through this security line this morning. So you know why we had to get here so early. Um, I think that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for being here. Bring your badges back tomorrow.